Hello, good afternoon. It is currently about four o'clock on Wednesday, the 1st of June. I hope that you got a chance to look at the introductory video that I posted yesterday. If not, please do take a moment to watch that so you get the review and you get the, the tour of your class. Uh, today, I have two fairly short topics for you. One is before first contact and the other is after first contact. And what I mean by first contact is when the European populations and people come to the new world. So let's start with the before first contact. And there are three groups of people I'm going to talk about here. Native Americans, also known as indigenous people, Europeans, and West Africans. So let's get started on this here. All right, the early Native Americans, uh, it's thought that they came across from Russia to, to Alaska. Uh, it's called the Bering Land Bridge. If you look at a map today, the Bering Land Bridge doesn't exist anymore, but you will see the Bering Sea. Uh, somewhere around 10 to 15,000 years ago, there was an ice age happening and the levels of the ocean much lower than they are today. So you could actually walk from Russia to Alaska. As these people moved into Alaska, uh, they were most likely following their prey, most likely following their food. Uh, they rapidly migrated to the, to the east and then to the south. And many moved into Mexico and Central America, and then others moved into Canada and the United States. Now, the spread of these Native American groups depended primarily on the availability of food. Uh, most of these indigenous groups are going to rely on hunting and gathering. Uh, farming in the Americas is actually, it's brand new. It doesn't begin until about 7,000 years ago. But even though farming in, in the uh, Americas begins about 7,000 years ago, it's still the secondary source of food up until about 1,000 AD. There are even some tribes who never farmed much at all, uh, especially those that are along the coastal areas. But by the time we get to the 1300s, uh, Native American cultural groups are spread all throughout North America and South America. And they develop very different ways of life and very different political structures. One group, the Anasazi, they are going to be very representative of what you see in the Southwest. The Anasazi nation subsisted on farming. They developed canals for irrigating and they developed cisterns to uh, collect and provide water for people. The fact that the Anasazi could do agriculture meant that they were able to build fairly large villages. And in places like modern day New Mexico, uh, there's, a, there's a, a settlement known as Chaco Canyon. And Chaco Canyon is 12 different villages grouped together. We think they probably had about 15,000 people at its largest. And Chaco Canyon, they actually build their houses into the side of cliffs. They built straight roads to connect their villages. There was a centralized political system, a centralized economic system, and they were very, very well structured. And even today in 2022, the remnants of them are still around. A little bit more familiar to us is the Mississippian culture. They developed along the the Mississippi River Valley and here in the uh, Southeast. The Mississippians were known to use bow and arrow. They're the ones who were farming corn and maize. And they built these huge elaborate towns that were capable of holding thousands of people. Some of these remnants, some of these cities are actually here in Georgia. If you've ever heard of, or if you've been to the Etowah Indian Mounds near Cartersville, that is the site of the most complete Mississippian village in the Southeast. A little bit further south, if you go down past where 
Albany is near the city of Blakely. You have the Kolomoki historic site, which is the oldest Mississippian site in the southeast. And then, if you ever go to St. Louis, in East St. Louis, on the east side of the river in what would actually be Illinois, you have the ancient city of Cahokia. Cahokia was a city that existed long before Christopher Columbus. It lasted from about 1,000 to maybe 1,300. Six square miles, 40,000 people. It had courtyards, it had temples, it had a, a giant fence, a wooden fence around it. And we didn't even know about it until the 1900s. So these Mississippian sites, they're like underneath our nose and we're still discovering them even today. Now, in general, Native American cultural groups are developed as these villages are created and as the indigenous people start to have permanent or semi-permanent villages. And this idea of kinship or kinship groups is going to become the most important thing in Native American culture. Uh, kinship groups were really just closely related families. You would have an extended family where you would have mom, dad, sister, brother, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents all living together. And then members of that family would marry other families and your kinship group would eventually grow. Before you know it, you have entire villages of related family members. And then after a while, these family ties are going to create nations and cultural groups. These kinship groups are really important because it gave the members of the society their place in the world if you will people knew what to do they knew their customs they knew their religion they knew their belief systems they knew right from wrong they knew what foods to eat how to hunt pretty much everything came from one of these cultural kinship groups when it comes to gender roles uh, positions and duties of men and women, it depended upon their individual culture, but for the most part, they are a lot more even than you might expect. Uh, villages that relied on hunting and gathering, men and women had to play different parts, but very important parts. Men were gone from the villages for extended periods of time, while the women were raising families and maintaining the household. Uh, men and women both have to share in the production of the food. And in some places, men and women do share power equally. Uh, however, though, in most Native American cultures, the religious leadership does remain in the hands of the males, but social and economic power very often is in the hands of women. Some of these Native American cultural groups have matrilineal descent, meaning through the mom, some have patrilineal descent through the, the father. And then also Native American religions, they're all slightly different, but it almost, in fact, I think every Native American religion I can think of has the idea that nature was alive, that there is spiritual power, that there was a creator there's prayer, there's afterlife, there are, that humans are basically just a part of the nature cycle. They don't control nature, but they're part of it. Europeans, I mean, we've been talking about Europeans pretty much since you were in kindergarten, so I'm not going to go super in depth with this, but European society, it's based on a social hierarchy and it's based on a political hierarchy. You have kings and queens at the top, you have lords and knights in the middle, and then you have peasants down towards the bottom. Certain appointed men are going to control society. Most monarchs are kings. There's a couple of queens here and there, 
and those that are wealthy are the only ones that are wealthy. As far as daily life goes, most Europeans at the time are living an agricultural agrarian lifestyle. They live in rural areas. There's only a couple of large towns or cities. Uh, really, you're only going to find towns of a couple thousand, uh, but a couple like London, Paris, and Rome, they're going to be big cities. You also have some political issues. Landowners are pushing the peasants off the land. Um, you have the Black Death, the bubonic plague, if you will. So there's a lot of problems with population going on in Europe. And because of all of these population issues and because of the financial issues that are happening, you don't really find large cultural groups in European society like you do in the Native American society. In Europe, it's really the nuclear family, the immediate family that, you, that you're concerned with. Christianity is very strong all the way up through the 1516, even 1700s. The Catholic Church was known simply as the church until 1517 and Martin Luther and the Reformation. With Martin Luther and the Reformation of 1517, you get Lutherans, you get Protestants, you get Calvinists, and church gets a little bit more complicated in the 1500s, but still Christianity is going to be what runs the average European's daily life. Europeans are also dealing with a renaissance, which causes people to ask questions and wonder more about the outside world. And you have very strong governments like the government of Spain, France, England, Portugal, who are going to be able to afford and encourage people to go out and explore. From there, we have West Africans. Over half of all immigrants to the New World between 1500 and 1800 come from West Africa, and almost all of those immigrants are going to be involuntary. Now, when we talk about West African society, um, it's not just one group. We're talking about many hundreds, if not thousands, of different cultural groups stretching from the countries of Senegal and Gambia all the way down into Angola. There are a lot of similarities, actually, between Native American cultural groups and West African cultural groups. Uh, there's a lot of subsistence farming. There's not a lot of of um, large cities or anything like that. The village is most important. Small-scale agriculture, trade with others. Gender roles are very important. Women are going to end up farming. Women are going to maintain the household while men do the hunting and raise the livestock. Families are going to be matrilineal, meaning that all the power and all the prestige comes from the mother's side of the family. So if you are a village leader, it's not your own son that you are wanting to protect. It's not your own son who's going to lead next. It is your sister's oldest son who will be the next leader because everything goes through the mother's side of the family. You also get this interesting mix of religions because you have the native religions who are going to be exposed to Islam very shortly after its foundation and many Africans convert to Islam and you get this new kind of hybrid religion. Um, you get a lot of native religions that survive the spread of Islam. People worship many gods. And in some cases, they worship their native religions while using Islam or even Christianity as the vehicle to do it. Um, it's very, very interesting to see how people of West African descent have maintained some of these native religions while still being converted to Catholicism or something like that. Now, what happens after first contact? We have some early explorations that are going to happen from Europe. 
Um, Europe is looking for a way to get African goods, including slaves. Europe is looking for a way to get to India without having to go through a middleman. And by the 1400s, you have Portuguese sailors going up and down the coast of Africa. They're trading goods, they're trading services. By the early 1500s, you have Portuguese sailors who are able to go around Africa and get to India. And Portugal, for a brief amount of time, is going to be the most powerful country in the world. They're going to control all the gold trade, they're going to control the slave trade, they're going to have a monopoly on getting back and forth to India, but that only lasts for a little bit, for a certain amount of time. Along with the exploration and the sailing of, the, of these Portuguese explorers, you get the beginnings of a European slave trade. Now, slavery did exist in Africa already, but it was different. European slavery is gonna be a much higher volume of, of taking. It's perpetual. In traditional African slavery, you were a slave only for a certain amount of time, or if you had a child, your child was considered free. But European slavery, once a slave, always a slave, and then any descendants you have will be a slave as well. Traditional African slavery is not based on race or color of skin. It's usually because of some sort of misfortune. Uh, maybe you got sold in slavery because of debts, maybe you broke a law, maybe you were stolen by somebody and basically kidnapped, but Europeans are going to base it solely on race and color of skin. Some African leaders are going to use the slave trade to their advantage. Uh, they'll attack a neighboring ethnic group and then take all of the men prisoner and sell those men into captivity while they can claim the territory that they have just taken over. We also have, you know, Spanish explorers. You've probably heard of this guy named Christopher Columbus. Uh, for whatever reason, in elementary school, they like to say Christopher Columbus discovered the, the, the Americas. In reality, Christopher Columbus is the last person to get to North and South America. In fact, Christopher Columbus, he goes to his deathbed not realizing that he was off the coast of North America. Uh, Christopher Columbus always thought he was near the coast of China and India. Now, Christopher Columbus, why is he important? Um, he believed the world was round, but he thought the world was smaller. Queen Isabella of Spain has just married King Ferdinand. And Isabella and Ferdinand want to pay somebody to sail around the world and find a quicker way to get to China. And Christopher Columbus says, hey, I know how to do that. And he gets a couple boats. He sails to the west. And he spots land in October of 1492. He thinks he's off the coast of China. He explores a couple islands and he claims that land in the name of Spain. Once in what we know today as a Caribbean, he's going to exploit the locals. He's trying to make as much money as he can. And at one point, Christopher Columbus is actually sent back to Spain as a prisoner and put in jail. Yeah, Christopher Columbus, not a very good guy. Moving on from there, we have some Spanish explorers who are known as the conquistadors. And these conquistadors are looking for treasure. You have Hernan Cortez in the year 1519, who is going to take over and capture the Aztec Empire. You've got Francisco Pizarro, who is exploring in Peru. He discovers the Inca Empire in 1531, and by 1536, the Inca Empire doesn't exist anymore. And then, I don't have him on the PowerPoint, but you've heard this name before, Ponce de Leon. Not only does Ponce de Leon have every, every other street in Atlanta named after him, Ponce de Leon was looking for the Fountain of Youth in southern Georgia, southern Alabama, and Florida. Between Pizarro 
and Cortez, they find tons of gold, tons of silver. They send all this gold and silver back to Spain and all of this money flooding the Spanish economy ruins the Spanish economy. Spain goes broke and this huge problem with inflation happens all throughout Europe. Now why was Spain doing their exploring? It was for permanent settlements and Spain had this goal of converting as many people as they could to Christianity. So you have Spanish setting up permanent settlements. The Spanish government is going to keep control over the colonists. Almost all the colonists are male and Spain is going to exploit the native populations pretty much any way they can. Spanish missions are going to be set up to try and convert people to Catholicism, destroy native religions, destroy native customs, and subjugate the locals and make them second-class citizens. There are some northern traders too. There are the French who are here mainly to make money and trade furs and, and find fish. You have Dutch who are going to settle what is today New York. You even have the Swedish here trying to do fur trading. There are a couple of large settlements made by the French. Quebec, Montreal, St. Louis are three of the biggest. And these northern traders are going to trade cloth and metal goods with the native populations in exchange for furs. Uh, some of these native groups actually become so dependent on European goods that they give up their traditional ways of life. French Catholics are also worried about converting people to Christianity but they go about it a little bit differently than the Spanish do. Where the Spanish are, are converting you forcibly, the French Catholics are taking time to get to know the people that they're trying to, to uh, convert, learn their language, and you know approach them almost as equals. And the last thing we have here is what's known as the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange, it describes the transfer, both intentional and unintentional, of biological materials between Europe and the Americas. Uh, this transfer, in many ways, it's good and it's bad all at the same time. A um, couple different categories. Uh, there's foods, uh, potato, corn, beans, squash. All of those items come from the New World and go back to Europe. Uh, potatoes grow where nothing else could and potato becomes very important to England, Northern Germany and Ireland where the wet soil and short growing seasons were perfectly fine for the potato. By the 1800s the potato is one of the most important crops in all of Europe. You can get fish off the coast of Canada new types of fish enter the European diet. The tomato appears in Europe for the first time and it's a valuable commodity in Italian cuisine today. And then you have corn. Corn goes on to become the number one eaten food in Europe. And even today corn is important for everything. We can make clothes out of corn. We can make fuel out of corn, we can make plastic out of corn, you name it. So corn is extremely important. The sugar trade is extremely important because Europeans had a very big sweet tooth and sugar gave high profits. If you wanted to make money in the new world, you made a sugar plantation. Before you know it, Brazil is the center of sugar production, Cuba and Hispaniola are also very important for sugar production. I mean sugar, just to kind of give you an idea how important sugar was, sugar caused the Dutch to give up their claim to New York. In exchange for giving up New York, 
they got sugar plantations in South America. There are some drinks. If you are a fan of coffee, coffee is brought to the New World during this exchange. And coffee is going to go on to um, create some of the middle class. Coffee is going to go on to become uh, the place where people like Isaac Newton do their research. In coffee shops, I should say. And coffee shops turn into some of the biggest businesses in the world today. Like, for example, Lloyd's of London, one of the largest insurance companies in the world, started as a coffee shop. Tea. Tea gets its start in Central Asia and becomes part of the Islamic world. From there, it's going to go to Brazil and it becomes very important in India. And you can almost argue and almost say that the entire British Empire is based off of the tea trade. Then you have Chocolate. Chocolate was a medicinal drink of Central America. Today, chocolate can be found anywhere, everywhere. It's cheap and pretty tasty, too. We do have to talk about slaves as well. Um, African slaves are going to be brought to the British islands in the Caribbean. African slaves are going to be brought to the Spanish islands in the Caribbean. African slaves are going to be brought to North America, Central America, South America. And the slaves are going to be a very large part of the population that moves to the New World. Uh, these slaves are going to be used to provide work for sugar plantations. And all total, when you look at how many people were taking, taken from Africa during the slave trade, some numbers put it as high as 30 to 40 million people were taken into bondage and became slaves. Just to give you an idea of how many slaves there were, I'm going to use Brazil as a representation. In 1798, the entire population of Brazil was about 3.25 million. Of that 3.25 million people, over 2 million of them were slaves. So that's Brazil, 1798. And then, got to talk about this too, disease. Diseases from Europe struck the native populations very hard. Uh, native Americans had nearly zero built-in immunity to the diseases of the old world. Diseases like measles, smallpox, mumps, pneumonia, they were completely devastating. Influenza was brand new. It was devastating. And in some areas, the native population suffered a 90% plus death rate. So uh, of, the 10 mil of the 10 people s standing around you, nine of them died from this. Most historians of early America estimate that the total native population of the Americas was about 30 million when Christopher Columbus landed, and that had dropped down to 5 million by the year 1650. So this transfer of biological items has a huge impact both on Western civilization and the native populations here in the New World. All right, that's a short little lecture, 30 minutes or less. If you have any questions about anything, send me an email. I'll be happy to answer. If there's anything I can do to make these videos better, let me know. If I need to go over the material slower, let me know. I want to do what I can to make this summer semester as successful for you as possible. So I do look forward to hearing from you, and I thank you very much for spending 30 minutes of your day with me watching these videos. We'll talk to you later. Have a great week. Bye for now.